All right, hello folks, how you doing today? We're back again with another Scott Davis video. Uh, today we're going into another piece of evidence that was lost. <clears throat> if you're wondering what you're looking at at the moment, that is the, Atlantis Police, the Atlanta Police Department's evidence room in 2005 when they were having so much trouble finding the evidence for this case. Yeah, it's amazing they could find anything in there. But anyway, so that's what that is you're looking at. But today this video is going to be dealing with the the expert witnesses who testified for the st state's pretrial motion to block the expert witness the defense wanted to have um, to have uh, testify uh, to help pin down when David Coffin's actual time of death might have been and so this is a pre this is a pretrial motion by the state to block this witness so this video will be focusing on the missing blood of David Coffin that was collected at his autopsy and why certain tests were not done and what possibly could be tested if it still existed today. Here we have the defense talking about why it wants to be able to admit this expert. The summary of the blood being lost here would be that the police, the police, if the police had bothered and the district attorney's office bothered, and the prosecution team bothered to find out what, if any, prescriptions Mr. Coffin was under, then we could find out if his blood was tested for these prescriptions. If he would if he would have taken a certain prescription in the morning and that prescription, that drug, would be gone within four to six hours, and that drug was found in his body, that means he was alive on Tuesday. Because the, if he would have taken that he would have taken that drug in the morning. If the drug was found there, and we know he was alive at least by 6 o'clock p.m. on Monday, that drug should not be there. We couldn't do that because we had no subpoena power back in 96, 97, 98, 99, and the state never bothered to get Mr. Coffin's medical records. They're all gone now. We don't have access to who his doctors were. We don't have access to where the prescriptions were filled, and it's gone because Detective Chambers will say, I didn't think it was necessary, essentially. Uh, but how important is that 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 back in in 96 97 98 99 they didn't have subpoena power and were powerless to do anything about this and when the charges are finally brought there's nothing they can do about it either so chambers would have said never bothered to do that he never bothered to do that we have a right to put on the evidence before the jury if we had that evidence and if it existed the jury has a right to weigh its admissibility and put any weight on it they want to to say whether the gentleman was alive on tuesday main issues being with the coffin's blood missing they they can't test for anything themselves and also that the panel of tests asked for by the metal ex medical examiner originally was not done how do you know that the medical examiner Hellman asked the crime lab to look for a large cluster of different drugs it's in the report from the medical examiner okay here it has the bait Bates mark of 00778 and what are you referring to specifically, and can you read from the report? It says, the report of the medical examiner of Fulton County at the top, and then it says, services have been requested of the following crime lab sections. So from here are specific requests for the crime lab. Blood alcohol section, toxicology section, criminalistics section, ballistics section, serology section. The following specimens have been collected and forwarded to the Forensic Sciences Division of the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. Blood from the heart, aortic root, kidney, tissue, and I, and I can only guess on this word, it's projectile fragment. Okay, something blood of my copy has a hole here, so it's difficult for this word. Physical or associative evidence for analysis. And then underneath it says, A request has been made to screen the toxicology samples for barbiturates, tranquilizers, sedatives, cocaine, opiates, alcohols, and acetone. A request has been made to test toxicology samples for cyanide, benzene, and carbon monoxide. From the information you have been given, what drugs were not tested for that were requested? There is no evidence that barbiturates were tested for. Uh, so he basically kind of goes through a list, and now is now it comes down to, um, you know, were sedatives not tested for? No, they weren't. Um, then they move on to now the cocaine that was tested for by the crime lab. Well, certainly there was a report of a cocaine metabolite being tested for. 
All right, so I'm going to kind of summarize here with what goes on with the cocaine. So they look, number one, for the parent cocaine. And if they don't find that, they look for the, the two byproducts of it, the benzo ek sorry, benzyl echogonine or the echogonine methyl ester. Those are the two byproducts of cocaine. If they know the person drinks or tends to drink alcohol, they will also look for the coca ethylene, which is the byproduct that's made in the body when you take cocaine and drink alcohol at the same time. They form a new compound, and it actually lasts a lot longer than the cocaine would on its own, but gives you the same, very much the same effects. So that's basically summarizing what's being said here. And he's saying that if, if it was him, he would he would call for the parent cocaine to be tested. He would then call for the benzo and the uh, the methyl and go echo nine methyl ester to be tested for, and uh, he would ask for nick nor cocaine to be tested for, and he would also ask for, uh, if he thought there was a history of drinking about the coca ethylene. So the reason why this is all important is because these things all have half lives, and so there's a certain amount of time they'll remain in the system, and the the they can only be broken down while you're still alive. So once you die, the the natural processes of your body breaking the, the cocaine the cocaine down or its byproducts down and getting rid of them stops for the most part. So that's kind of the argument that's being made here to give you kind of a brief idea. Uh, but you know that's essentially what we're getting at here. Okay, and the important part here, just to sum up, is there any evidence from all the documentation you reviewed that, although requested by the medical examiner of Fulton County, that the Georgia Crime Lab actually tested for these opiates? There is no indication in the reports that they were ever tested for. So, and it was like that with every drug that they went through on the on the medical examiner's list. All right, so now the d defense is asking about carbon monoxide because. The lab reported that there was not a significant amount reported when they checked the lungs. But if you had the blood of Mr. Coffin today in 2006 and the Honorable Bruce Morris were able to produce that for you, could you have a laboratory with appropriate structure, infrastructure controls, blah, 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 test it, um, you know, for carbon monoxide in the blood of Mr. Coffin? Sure. Now, assuming that you had the blood, assuming that you had the right controls and all that, could you come in here with findings and tell the Honorable Judge Campbell what those numbers were rather than using a name? not significant concentration i'm sorry what are you are, are you you're asking if i've ordered an analysis to be done could i come in here with a number and could give to the court and tell the number what that was or the court what that number was yes sure could you extrapolate from that number and tell the court based on an opinion from science whether or not mr coffin was alive at the time the fire of the fire to breathe it could you possibly testify with scientific certainty that the mr coffin was you know alive or dead at the time of the fire the answer to your question is yes, but I have to put in two caveats there. First of all, anytime I said something like that, I would thoroughly document it. I would never come to you, sir, and say, this is significant or not significant. You know, trust me on this. It would be, here's what is in the literature. This is what we see in smokers. This is what we see in people that have been in fires. These are the kinds of concentrations, and based upon this, this is where my opinions come from. The second thing, and just as important, is I would critically go and look to see whether the victim had been a smoker. I mean, this is an incredibly important thing because I don't know, and I can't tell from this whether he was a smoker, how much he was a smoker, and so much, and so what is the definition, and I can't tell from this whether the person who actually did the analysis had the information to make the conclusion that, that the, the negative for a significant quantity of carbon monoxide remembering of course that carbon monoxide is very very potent so essentially he, he he's wondering how this person in the lab could come up with a p opinion that it was not significant amount of carbon monoxide when the he when that person in the lab doesn't even seem to know whether or not mr coffin was a smoker so here we have the prosecution getting a little combative <clears throat> the results are there but i thought i heard you say quite often that based on everything you don't have a lot of faith in the tests that were done in this case and they may or may not have been accurate. What I'm saying is, is you folks have not provided any quality assurance documents in order to come up with some measure of comfort. However, in the context of what we have available to us in this trial, this, this concentration is what you say it is, and it's your word, not mine, so I have to accept you, the prosecution's word, that it is real. No, doctor, you don't have to accept anything that I say. What I'm asking you is, what is your opinion of the results? I thought I heard you say, and I'll allow you to elaborate or to explain, and I can go back 
and quote it, you basically ripped up the results in the lab and said they are not that accurate. What I said is there is no quality control information provided. There is a lot of information in here that would be required if I was going to do an analysis of how useful this information is. However, in the context of this trial and what we are dealing with here, if the results are what the state says is, that is 80, then that's what I worked with. If you want to call the state a liar, that's fine, but the state says it's 80. <laughs> so, I find that I found that part kind of funny, you know, he's um and he's basically saying, you can you can say what you want about what I may have thought of the findings, but I worked with the findings that I was given by the state and the, what they tested. And I just thought that was funny. Then we can reach a, a, con a conclusion that Saturday was the date he used. I reached the conclusion based on the information the state provided me. If you are telling me the state is wrong and provided inaccurate information, I just have to look at you and go, why? Why didn't you guys do it right? Are you trying to hide something? Yeah, you get the impression with this one the defense was already bracing for the worst. But so, anyways, they're talking about the alcohol that may have been in David, Mr. Coffin's stomach, um, and and how it absorbs into the system normally with a person that's alive. And anyways, uh, so <clears throat> now when it's someone unfortunately that passes on and is not living, does the stomach content of alcohol still go into the intestines and into the bowels? Ms. Ross, Your Honor, the state is going to object to this not being relevant for the purposes of this Harper hearing concerning cocaine usage. Mr. Steele, the gentleman testifies as to alcohol and retrograde on direct examination. I'm going to tie that in to the use of all narcotics. No, sir. He was not asked about one narcotic on cross-examination. He, he, we asked him nothing about alcohol. We kept our examination to cocaine and prescription drugs. The court... Let's confine it to cocaine, Mr. Steele. That is why we are here. Mr. Steele, may I ask one last question? The court, okay. The last question was, after death, when a person dies, do their, do, do their stomach contents still pump out or, or absorb and get rid of the alcohol that may be in it? I think that's highly dependent on the decedent. I don't know if, if, if we know absolutely whether the pyloric sphincter, which is what separates the stomach from the small intestine, whether that always seals off or whether that can remain open. There is certainly the possibility that it does not close off and there is alcohol remaining in the stomach that because of the fact that the alcohol can absorb from the stomach that it's very possible that some that some and very likely a high enough concentration uh, some will continue to absorb into the bloodstream. In this case there is a stomach content sent to the GBI crime lab or captured by the medical examiner are you familiar with that? Yes. Could that be tested if it were here for alcohol in the stomach if we had that content? Miss Ross. Objection, Your Honor. He asked his one last question, and now he is going back into alcohol. All the evidence was lost. We have to make a record. As much as the state wants to breathe heavy on what procedures could have been done for Mr. Davis, this gentleman is testifying. If the stomach content was here, what tests could be done here today? The state lost the evidence, whether recklessly, intentionally, or negligently. It was prior to Mr. Davis's being able to look at any of the physical evidence in this case, and the court, with all due respect, has admitted this evidence anyway, allowed the medical examiner to testify to the stomach content and we never tested. Miss Ross, Your Honor, the proper time for that evidence is in the Trombetta hearing, which is which the court held in April of two thousand five. The court has ruled and I ask that he not be allowed to ask any more questions in this Harper hearing because it is not relevant. This is not a Trombetta hearing. We had we had that in April. I understand Mr Steele wasn't here for that, but the court has ruled on all on all these issues. The court, okay, that's what I am recalling. Is that what we did, in fact? Take under consideration the question about the lost and destroyed evidence, which the concern was that that was not available for testing, and I think we have already ruled on that issue. I may have to pull the order out. Mr. Steele, you did. You found prejudice. The court found prejudice, but no intentional misconduct, which I disagree with highly. <clears throat> the court, no bad faith or in no, in no intent. Mr. Steele, that's what I think. The court, yes. Mr. Steele, and the Supreme Court did not take the case, so it is still ripe. There is no jury here. This is this is all. The Supreme Court looks at the entirety of the record. They do not confine themselves 
to departmentalize on the motions. They are going to look at the whole transcripts to see <clears throat> the prejudice to Mr. Davis or not. And I'd like to ask this gentleman his opinion. The court. Okay, well, you can go ahead. You know, so what the defense is getting at here is if there was a stomach contents, they believe they might have found things like maybe um, undissolved pills, which certainly would have had him alive at the time of the fire and stuff. So this this stomach contents thing is an issue, and it's it's being brushed aside, and, and I think it's kind of unfair. So anyways, we see here where he asks this, this doctor about the stomach contents, and this toxicologist basically kind of says, yeah, we could do it, and yeah, maybe it might be informative, maybe not, and he just, you know, wishy-washy, doesn't really give any kind of a definite answer. But, I mean, the fact of the matter is, is if we if we would have seen those stomach contents, and if there was an unre undissolved pill, uh, you know, whatever, maybe heart medication he was taking, we know he had, uh, in these transcripts, it talks about he had pretty serious uh, um, aortic problems um, due to, you know, cholesterol, I think it was, or whatever. So, um, I mean, so, I mean, it's, it's highly possible he was on medications from his doctor or something. And if they could find something like that, they could certainly quantify the time of death. And that's what the defense is getting at here. And they are getting, they're pointing out that they get no chance to do this. The prosecution tested all this stuff, and they're able to put up their witnesses to, to, and to, to speak about all these things. But the defense is basically sitting there having to deal with what little information comes out in the reports, and then what they're going to be able to find out on cross examination of prosecution witnesses. So, I mean. The, the playing field has certainly been tipped here. It has certainly been tipped. And, I mean, it's it's disturbing, especially if you've watched my other video and you realize, you realize how much Megan lied and how actually culpable she probably is because she's the one that knows that David was shot. We got four people that, that were around when she did it. Two people testified to it. So, anyways, we'll move on to the next bit. All right, I just quickly want to point out, this guy's a prosecution witness. He's in there because the prosecution asked him to be there, and I don't think they wanted him to say this, but he's asked here about what does it mean if you find BE in the blood, uh, which is the benzyl engonine, uh, engonine. Anyway, what does that mean if it's found in the blood? And he says basically nothing, but then he says, it tells me that the person used, probably since the, the, the BE is found in the blood, we tend to presume... More often than not, that the person was generally a chronic, not necessarily high dose, but let's say a frequent cocaine user. But it tells me nothing about the time of use without the finding of cocaine in the postmortem specimen. Its interpretation essentially tells me nothing more than the person was a cocaine user. Now, the thing I think that's interesting here is because this prosecution and and all that has been the whole time trying to downplay this, trying to suggest that that somebody uh, dosed him with it, put it in a drink or some food, uh, which I'm not sure who would do that other than Megan. Uh, but anyway, they're, they're, they're just offering things like that as, as explanations or that he was around people that were like smoking it and stuff and that he somehow inhaled it into his lungs like that. So here's the funny part, folks. Del the Dr. Delaney, the toxicologist that, that the defense is trying to get um approved to be their uh expert witness um in this case actually has documentation that he brought to court and it is part of the record that the at least the supreme court will be able to look at uh talking about how ridiculous that is so ridiculous that that they're even trying to suggest that that can happen because the studies in which they they uh studied the possibility of that happening even in like a tiny, tiny little broom closet with three people where they were pumping massive amounts of the, you know, cocaine smoke into the room or whatever. When they tested those guys afterwards, they had just completely negligible amounts in their bloodstream and in their lungs and whatever. So it was it, so there's documentation that Dr. Delaney has that that could be offered to prove that to blow that out of the water. So this is the, the medical examiner testifying here. Uh, so the answer is you have seen it drop to that level. I believe I have, he says. Is that a common thing within hours for it to drop that low? And I don't know off the top of my head. 
Would you agree that it's a low level in comparison to the blood levels of persons using cocaine? Yes, it is lower than typically a fourth or fifth of what is commonly seen. So that really suggests to me that David Coffin's body was having the time to metabolize and filter out that cocaine before he died, which suggests he was not dead on Monday. So this is basically the defense summing up in the uh, pretrial motion here about the expert witnesses trying to get their expert witness, Delaney, um, authorized to testify at trial. Because they really want the jury to see about this missing evidence and how important it really would have been to the defense if it were, if they had access to it, if it hadn't been lost. And that's really what I want to hammer home here is think about it. If you were suspected of a crime but ultimately let go because they didn't have any evidence against you, they didn't have anything physical, nothing to really tie you to it other than speculation and hearsay and, and, and circumstantial supposition, uh, I mean, think about it. I mean, and then suddenly nine years later they come after you, but all the evidence that they were able to test is gone. They can still put up their expert witnesses to testify about that evidence, but you can do nothing about it. I mean, just imagine that for a second if it was you. So, I mean, hey, if you're out there and you have any kind of a sympathy for what this guy might be going through, I know I have sympathy for what he's going through because if it was me, I would be totally beside myself. But he, we see here at the end that the court, the court, the judge basically denies them. He denies, well, what he does is he grants the state's motion. He grants the state's motion to exclude the testimony of Dr. Delaney, which is the defense's witness. And that's it. So, I mean, really tying the defense's hands to put up a defense at every turn, it looks like. This is Megan Bruton. She is the one who knew that David Coffin had been shot before anybody else. There's two people that testified to this. I'm going to be showing you in my next video that one of them basically says outright that they told Detective Chambers that Megan had said this in a conversation to Scott before anything could have been found out. So the the problem here is 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 that she it, she obviously knew before and 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 like I said there's another video I have you can go look at. The phone records prove it. The phone the phone records prove that she when these calls happened and stuff and her friends were standing there. One of them was David Coffin's best friend and one of them was her best friend. Both say they heard her say it prior to Scott saying it at the police station. So you couple that with the fact that Chambers then deliberately ignores that information and, and you'll hear that from Craig Foster in my next video. You take the fact that all the evidence is lost, which Chambers was responsible for, which, I mean, he was working so hard on this case and you'll see that in the next video of, uh, of how much he was doing in this case and all the things that he was doing, but he lets all of this evidence just slip away. Uh, right, you know, pretty much right before this trial happens, a lot of it just slips away. So, uh, be go ahead and be looking for my next video, which, I, like I said, will be centering on Mr. Chambers, Detective Chambers, and the antics of Megan Bruton. Um, you know, her dishonest nature, and why it's just a tragedy that Chambers never ever even considered looking at her as a suspect 